Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. All right, so without any further ado, I'm excited to introduce uh, Renice Washington, a nurse practitioner with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute for today's program. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the invite, Katie, and I appreciate everybody for coming. I'm excited about being here and um, my uh, just excitement about being able to talk about this subject. She talked about some of the programs that are offered. Um, I work here at Northside. I've been here now 17 years this past June 5th. I made 17 years, quite excited. And I currently do female cancers, which include ovarian, cervical, um, endometrial or uterine cancers. But I have a background in primary care, HIV AIDS, and um, also did um, some prison um, um, hospital. So I'm quite excited to talk about the primary care side and also some of the cancer side. And our talk, of course, is going to be symptoms that catch your physician's attention and things that I would hope that you would feel comfortable um, broaching with your uh, nurse practitioner, your physician, your PA um, that is taking care of you. I have to give a big disclaimer. <laughs> your physician is the only one um, that you can have some of these healthcare discussions with based on their knowledge of your health history and their clinical management of you. So I am not your physician. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is bring up things that I have just experienced as I've dealt with patients or patient stories. A lot of the stories will be from when I was at Grady because I really don't wanna bring anything where anybody would be recognized from this hospital. So forgive me that I'm using something um, like HIV AIDS to discuss um, the care, but I think some of the same principles do apply. We will talk about things that a cancer patient should be um, aware of or a previous cancer patient or their family member should be aware of. But I just wanna put this big disclaimer that um, some of the questions that you might have at the end, I might have to redirect you back to your physician. I am not the physician um, that is managing you. I don't probably know your history. And um, uh, that's a huge responsibility to take on to really know somebody and care for them. And that's what I do daily. I round on patients. I get into their, um, not just their, um, their medical history, but their family history and what's going on in the house. And you end up being really a team. I got a lot of my references from the American Cancer Society, and I wish I could have talked about much more than I'm going to talk about today because, oh my goodness, there were so many things I could have had a conversation about, but I had to limit it to an hour plus give time for people to ask questions or to, to have uh, any thoughts they would like to pass forward. Teamwork. If I can share anything with you, it's teamwork. This is a team effort. I'm going to go back to when I first started as a nurse practitioner in 1998. My first job was at an HIV AIDS clinic at uh, Grady. Um, they had just come out with the triple cocktail, which would allow um, uh, people to live longer. Um, but if you'll think about it, cancer is now using pills and it's considered chemotherapy. But back then, I never forget my lead MP, my manager told me, we're basically giving these HIV AIDS patients chemotherapy. We're giving them something oral to make a change in the body to help them survive this disease. And I'll never forget, I met one of my patients on the intake day on a Thursday, it was my intake days. And I said to her, let's talk about your history. And she says, listen, you know, she got it unknowingly from her husband who had passed. But what she said to me was, I don't want to have this discussion. I trust you. Just do what you need to do. And I was concerned. I was like, well, well, let's talk about it. Let's be a team. She's like, nope, don't want to do it. This is horrible what happened to me. I trust what you're doing. Just do it. And then we, I took care of her for about a year, and then she disappeared for about six months. She didn't let me know that her mother had gotten ill in New Orleans, and she had gone to New Orleans to take care of mom. And there was a drug that we were given, and I forgot the name of it. It starts with the N. I'm sorry. It's been a while. And once the person has a side effect from it, you can never re-challenge them again, or it can literally kill them. And um, she went to New Orleans. She took the drug. She had a reaction. It was a pill. They re-challenged her, and she told me she ended up in the ICU. And when she came back, she told me, she says, never again will I not know what's going on with my body. Never again will I trust 
that, you know, you guys and nothing personal, but you guys have it all. She said, I'm in this with you. She says, I want to know about my drugs. I want to know about my side effects. I want to have a discussion. And from then on, me and her were like a team. So as you see, you know how you do the pile on, like we're a team, go team. It's a team effort. I need you as a provider to help me as I'm trying to manage your care. And you're trying to lean on our expertise. But a lot of times you patients are helping us because you've like discovered something or you've done some research that's really good. And I am not intimidated by research. Please, if you got something you want to share with me, I love to hear it. So um, let's just say teamwork is my main thing. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, to people who are active chemo patients or radiation patients. I want to talk to people who've completed their therapy and your state of health when you were diagnosed. So. Some of the things that really are concerning to me, and I'm just going to give you this long laundry list that I wrote down, high or low heart rate, lower high blood pressure, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, lab changes. Are your electrolytes high or electrolytes low? Your potassium, your sodium, your calcium. How's your kidney acting? Is your kidney function okay? Are your red blood cells okay? How about your hemoglobin hematocrit? How about your platelet count? What about that white count? You having fever, chills? Are you having any kind of altered mental status where you're not thinking as clearly as you should? Weakness, fatigue, pain, swelling, shortness of breath, um, any kind of neuropathy in your fingers, your toes, sexual issues, hot flashes, pressure sores, nail, hair, skin changes, insomnia. These are things that would be concerning to me, whether you're in the hospital or whether I'm talking to you outpatient. And these are things that some of them we'll get to today, but your state of health is very important. And also remember that when you begin this journey, you came into the journey with high blood pressure, maybe. You came into the journey with diabetes, maybe. You came into the journey, maybe, with thyroid issues. You came into the journey, maybe, with lupus. Well, what I have found is sometimes we focus so hard on the cancer, we forget that we were taking care of our health in other areas. And I just want to warn you and just please do not do not think expect or hope that your cancer doctor can manage your primary care issues or your rheumatological issues or any other issue that has nothing to do with cancer what i have found is when i've dealt with a diabetic i was like well when's the last time you saw your primary care you know sort of watched over your diabetes oh well no my cancer doctor has that well, first of all, I would be scared to have any cancer doctor help me manage my diabetes if I had diabetes, because that's not their field of expertise, and that's not what they do, and that's not what they know. So I wouldn't trust them to help me keep that in check. And so what you don't want to do is forget about your total person, who you are, because all that needs to be in good health also as we're managing your health as you go forward. Um, that's one thing I want to talk about. Don't neglect your preventative maintenance. Um, I know that, you know, when you're having uh, a cancer diagnosis and, you know, we're telling you, you got to be here for chemo. Oh, you got to do this for the radiation. We've got this schedule for pre-labs, got this schedule for post chemo labs. You're thinking, I can't do one more thing. Or perhaps you've gotten through your, 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 um, your chemo treatments and you're on the other side and you're in the survivorship mode. And it's time to start saying, how am I taking care of my health? Yes, I'm keeping those every three month, every six month scans. But are you taking care of the total you? Are you really taking care of yourself? Um, when I first started HIV AIDS, I can remember my um, manager, nurse practitioner saying to me, you have to work with the patient's current state of health. And so what she was trying to say to me was, if they've come in debilitated because of their health issues, meaning, you know, your diabetes is out of control and you're running at 600 or 700 blood sugar, then I need to understand that I might have a little bit more challenge as I'm trying to care for you because there's another area of your life that's trying to um, debilitate you. And so we don't want to we don't want people to forget that so that you can keep everything in your primary care part, like your kidney issues, any kind of emotional issues, um, obesity, um, postmenopausal issues, any of these issues, you want to make sure that you're seeing somebody besides your cancer doctor. And I know I'm saying one more test, one more doctor, but I'm encouraging you to lean on your primary care, know your internal medicine doctor. I'm really good friends with mine. 
Um, I definitely have been seeing her about five or six years. And I try to build that relationship so that when something goes wrong, I have somebody to to send up my little message to the portals they have now to say, listen, I need help in this area. And I've had some emergencies happen. I'll never forget somebody on here now. We were getting ready to go to Greece on a vacation. And literally, my I had a bursitis in my knee. And I thought, I can't sit on a plane for eight hours. Well, because I was in relationship with her, I was able to write her and say, I need a referral stat to see the orthopedic doctor. And he got me on that plane, got me through my trip. But if you don't have that relationship, then a lot of times you're not getting the help and the need, the, um, the care that you really need. Um, you can optimize your health during treatment. I'm a firm believer in exercise and we have the cancer uh, support um, of Atlanta. They have uh, exercise programs that are based and geared toward people that have cancer or have had cancer. Um, I know currently I work out with a young lady that has um, had breast cancer and my, um, Unfortunately, my personal trainer doesn't understand that she can't lift those weights with that arm that they did her biopsy underneath her arm with because of a fear of lymphedema. So I just talked to her. I said, where's your sleeve? Like I asked her, where's your sleeve? She says, girl, I know I should be wearing my sleeve. Yes, ma'am, you should. So just know that exercise during treatment, after treatment, before treatment, and for anybody on here, um, whether you have cancer or not, We've got to start moving. We've got to start walking. We've got to start doing something. I decided to do walking. It's a fat burner. And so I'm trying to get up. So I'm two days in. So I'm trying to make this a, a regular occurrence for me because I recognize that I've got to get some cardio in. A healthy diet. The standard American diet, which is called the SAD diet, is literally causing us health issues, we are micronutriently um, unhealthy on the cellular level because we are eating so much processed food that our body is not able to withstand or able to help heal itself or help help along with what you're doing with as far as um, any kind of treatment or non-treatment. If you're through the treatment, your body needs the nutrients in order to help the cellular level and some of the genetics that we have going on to make sure that we stay where we should be. Um, so when you um, are eating the standard American diet, which is high fat, a lot of um, processed salty foods, there is zero nutrient value in that. And what's happening is, is that we look like we are on the outward side of us. We look very, very healthy, but inwardly we're not. And that leads to, for instance, depression. If you have don't have energy, maybe, and you're saying, well, gosh, I don't have energy. I feel really low. A lot of that is coming from the fact that perhaps you're not getting the vitamins you need in order to sustain yourself outwardly. You look fine on the outside. You look sort of juicy and healthy, but inwardly you're not doing well. Emotional care. You have to do emotional care before, during, after emotional care is vital. Um, I am a holistic uh, nurse. Most nurses are holistic. We believe in that you have to be in health, spirit, mind, and body. If emotionally you are not in a place of wellness, then what you can find is that, you know, have you ever had a situation like maybe you were really stressed, you were taking care of a parent or something, and you were doing well, and you're like, man, I had energy doing that. But as soon as that ended, you had a collapse and you got sick. Well, that's why. So emotional care and making sure that you take care of your reserves is very important for every person. And that's something that we have to do. Um, stress releases a lot of hormones, especially steroids. Um, and that keeps you in a state of flight or uh, fight uh, mode. And your body doesn't like that. Your body doesn't like to constantly be in that. So I do recommend counseling. I do recommend talking to somebody, whether it's a friend, a counselor. Um, I do re recommend emotional care and spiritual care. Um, whatever your belief system might be, I believe in spiritual care because I do believe that we are more than just a body. We are more than just a dis-ease. And when you say dis-ease, I think something is not at ease. So what we want to have is you to be totally at ease. And all of these components together after treatment, during treatment can help you uh, as you get back into your quality of life. So let's talk about the white count, fever red blood cell count, platelet count, blood clots, and fever first. Fever. 
So first of all, because I do surgery, I do mostly surgeries. Um, we do G1 oncology. We do a lot of the ball game takeout, do a lot of hysterectomies. Um, I do worry about fevers, but whether you are a surgical candidate or whether you are not, you need to um, be concerned about fevers. Um, so some of the things that I would ask you are, you know, is there any burning with urination? And this is even a cancer patient. Do you have a sore throat? Are there sores in your mouth? Do you have any kind of shakes or chills? Any kind of nasal congestion? Um, is there any kind of warm area on a foreign object that somebody's placed in you like a port, a pleurex or foley? And as I said, recent surgery. So for my surgery patients, we go really all out when we're thinking warmth, redness, pain, swelling. We get very excited. We get very excited about fever and we get excited about a high white count. Um, I want to give a story about me and denial. So what happens to everybody, and it's just not, you know, you guys here, is in March, um, I went to a uh, mission conference and um, I sat next to a guy from Germany. And he was just blowing his nose and sneezing. So I'm thinking, the man came from Germany, got allergies from Georgia. You know, what am I worried about? And so every general session, I felt sort of like he was lonely. Like, you know, nobody else was fit with him. But he was doing a lot of sneezing and blowing his nose. And I should have took the hint, but I did not. So that was on a Wednesday. On Friday, I drug myself out of bed to go to church. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm hurting so bad. I don't know if I can do this. I just was aching. And I had the sunroof back. The sun was in my face. Not like right now here in Georgia where it's raining, but I had the sun in my face and I was just a driving, but I felt peaked. I felt like, oh, I felt a peak. I don't feel myself, but I'm okay. You know, push through. Then I went to Costco. Okay, I'm going to drag myself and get groceries. And then I drove home, sunroof's back. And I said, man, I feel a little warm. I'm going to try that thermostat and see do I have a fever, but I bet it, you know, and I was 102.2. And I said to myself, oh, no, 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 girl. That's from that sunroof. You were in the it took me an hour to get from Costco to my house in East Point. I thought, it's the sun. And so I said, sit here and cool off, you know, retest in 30 minutes. And I was 101.5. Well, when I pulled out my free COVID test, I had COVID. And my symptoms only included a congested nose. That's all I had. And sneezing. Same symptoms the gentleman on Wednesday had. And I was on Sunday. So five days later. So what I'm saying is, there's a tendency to minimize what is happening to you. And for me, I think that's huge. If you think something's wrong, it took me, what, four to five hours to come to the conclusion that I was sick. Um, I'm glad that I did, but even I go into denial. So I would encourage you that if you're having a temperature of 100.5 or greater, I would encourage you to call somebody because something's wrong. It's not normal. It is not. Um, so I'm a detective. I didn't know that when I went to nurse practitioner school. Nobody told me that I'd be detecting. I just thought I'd go in and just, you know, take care of the patient. But when you present to me, I've got to figure out what is causing the situation. So we go into detective mode. So I'm going to check your white, your CBC, which includes your white count. I'm going to see if you're high, you're low. And as you know, if you're getting treatment, your low white cells can be neutropenia. And you're saying, well, what's well, neutropenia? Well, your actual neutrophil count. Those are the good guys. Like if you have an army, these are the guys you want to help you fight off any kind of infection. And when you uh, maybe within 10 days of you getting some type of chemo, you might find that you start dropping out. Um, and so we normally give you something to help bring your white count back up because we're trying to keep you from getting any kind of infection. Um, just know that if you have a low white count, you might not have enough white count to generate the fever that I would normally see in somebody that has it, isn't, is not currently under any kind of cancer treatment. This goes for the AIDS patients too. They're immunocompromised. Your fever might not actually mount if you don't have enough of white cells that you need to cause you to mount that response. Now, after procedure or surgery, I don't want to see a high white count. And if we do, you're not going home. And that happened yesterday. I had a lady, you know, she came out, she looked great. She looked actually really well. Like, you know, clinically, if you looked at her and walked in the room, I think, well, you know what? You're not, you're going home. Bye. You know, one day surgery, it's time to go. But unfortunately we could not. Um, so when you have a white, high white count, we get concerned and we start trying to think why. And if it continues to stay high, we start doing scans. We start doing blood cultures. We start doing anything that we can think of. 
Um, let's talk about the, the older person, my mom. Um, she never had cancer. We think maybe at the end she might have, but when she had a urinary tract infection, you're elderly and you're very young, do not act like the people in between those ages. And so she got a urinary tract infection and almost went comatose. Um, and that's what you'll see in some of your elderly patients. So we're concerned about fever, but we're also concerned that if you're not behaving like yourself, um, the fever is telling your physician, we need to do something. There's something going on. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out what's wrong. Blood clots. Oh my gosh. I got a good blood clot story. So, um, I was working locally and, um, uh, someone in the Navy with me, um, he was 34 years old. Um, he was active duty at that time. It was an active duty base up at Dobbins at that time. And he, um, started complaining of calf pain after having had knee surgery. And one thing that I realized about being in the military and doing the reserves is that we're focused on how do we rescue you after, you know, a gunshot wound or after um, some kind of warlike crisis. So a lot of times we're not looking at the whole person. And I think that's what happened. A lot of the physicians that were normally active duty there, they were off. And so um, there was no PA or nurse practitioner that was sort of manning. Um, they had an RN that was sort of keeping the clinic stuff going as far as labs, if somebody needed labs or something. So this is a primary care clinic. Um, the gentleman had knee surgery. He had it in town um, and his calf was hurting. His calf hurt for about a week. And he went to dinner with a shipmate. And as they came back, she said he, he went unconscious. And what happened was he had a deep vein thrombosis or a blood clot in his calf. And when it let loose, it went to his lung. And unfortunately, he didn't make it. So DVTs to me are very concerning. My cousin had one because when you take birth control pills and you smoke after 40 um, and nobody told her to stop smoking or to get off her estrogen um, uh, uh, birth control, um, she ended up having a PE. And she told me it was one of the scariest moments in her life. She says, Renice, I couldn't breathe. She said, I just couldn't. And unfortunately, it's up to us to stay aware of what we need to be telling you to warn you about things. But some things that could cause you to have a deep vein thrombosis or a blood clot in your leg is estrogen use, hormone replacement, uh, any kind of hip orthopedic surgery, pelvic surgery, abdominal surgery. So my patients, pregnancy, cancer patients, for cancer patients, what happens is um, your cancer actually makes a hormone to fool the body to make it think that it needs the clot. So we have a whole clotting cascade where the body says from the liver, this is how we're going to actually clot. And what happens in the cancer, you have an outside entity talking to the body and the body doesn't know it's not the, the liver making the clotting factors. It thinks it's the liver talking, but it's not the cancer saying, by the way, I need you to clot. And what happens is a lot of times the first time that somebody even knows they have cancer is they had a blood clot. Because if you show up with a blood clot and you don't have, you haven't had some kind of surgery, you're not pregnant, you're not on estrogen, um, then the first thing we begin to think is we need to rule out that you don't have any type of cancer. Um, COVID was just another situation. Um, what happens with the COVID clots is that they stick to the point that even when we use um, a clot buster, it will actually break through and re-clot because they were so sticky. So um, COVID sort of changed how we looked at blood clots as far as how they can be initiated. And so COVID just sort of threw off the game, but they did realize that one way to make sure that the person survived it back in 2020 was to put them on a blood thinner. Being bedridden, um, I don't know if you remember um, David um, Bloom, the NBC correspondent, who, when we first went back to war um, in um, Iraq, he was riding in um, a lot of the armored vehicles. And as you know, in that heat, um, my dad worked in Saudi Arabia. And let me just tell you, I've never felt hot like that in my whole life. I remember we stayed in Lockheed Village. I walked probably 10 minutes from his little house to the little, you know, mini mart inside the compound. And by the time I got back, I had to lay down because it was like 120 degrees outside. 
in the summer. So here he is out there in that kind of heat. Um, and once again, he began to tell people I'm having, you know, leg cramps. He's a taller man. He's sitting in that position with, as you know, in a car position. And, um, but the medics remember are trained for trauma. They're not really trained and the medics are enlisted and they're really good and they call them docs because they actually save people's lives. Like if you got shot, these guys are the guys you want doc there. You want doc to be there to help rescue you. But unfortunately they're not really versed on blood clots. And so he had a blood clot while he was sitting at that angle and actually it went to his lung. And so when I have a surgical patient and they're telling me they got to go back to Albany from Atlanta, I put Ted hose on them. My doctor, Dr. Fuhrer says they have to get out every 45 minutes and walk around for 15. I tell them to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. I said, do you want caffeine before you leave the hospital and don't do any more caffeine till you get home? Um, if they have to get on a plane, we'll actually tell them that, you know, maybe we should put you on a blood thinner and or maybe and or we might say aspirin. So just know that um, blood clots, you do want to know um, why they're happening. And these are some of the reasons. Yeah. Um, Things to not. So there was a situation where I had a patient. Um, she had to go to Vanderbilt because she had a benign tumor in her ear. And she told the nurse before she left. And this is when I want to also encourage you to feel free to fight for yourself um, because, you know, you're your best advocate. And I am not I don't get upset when a person fights for themselves because I need to listen. Maybe. Um, so she told the nurse, there's something wrong with my leg. It's swollen. And the nurse said, well, don't worry about it. We're going to go ahead and discharge you. But when you get back to Atlanta, they'll take care of it. So she walks into the primary care office that I was working at. And I almost had a stroke myself in front of her because when I saw the leg, I thought, oh, my God, this lady has a blood clot because it was so significantly bigger than the other. Um, and one thing I want to tell you is I love to tell patients this is that you are symmetrical. So your eyes should look the same, your mouth should look the same, your ears, your shoulders should be the same height. Everything should look the same. And so when I look at your legs and I see one big leg and one isn't, unless we've worked it up and we figure out there's something wrong, I'm concerned. And an ultrasound costs almost nothing. So um, this lady ended up having a blood clot for her leg. We were able to treat her, she was fine. But she came four hours across the mountain. Remember I told you she was in a seated position in a car, which is very concerning because that could have led to something more detrimental. But things that you don't want to ignore is edema to one leg, um, especially when there's no trauma or nothing has happened. Edema to a site with a pick line or a port. One arm swells up, the other one doesn't. And it's not because of breast cancer and you have a lymphedema. Um, chest pain, fast heart rate, shortness of breath, or coughing up blood. These are things um, that you know, you need to say something. Um, I decided one time to take a bus, Greyhound. And yes, I was a nurse practitioner and I did take Greyhound. And I went to Florida to meet my family for a family reunion because I knew that if I drove, I'd probably run off the road and I didn't have enough money for a plane ticket. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to take the Greyhound. Ended up with a whole emergency, medical emergency on there with a diabetic, but that's another whole nother story that y'all don't want to hear about. But needless to say, when I got there, one of my legs was killing me and it was the calf. And yes, I wanted to enjoy my family reunion, but I also knew you can't walk away from this. You've been sitting for eight hours on a bus. You've been sitting in a certain position. Your leg wasn't bothering you before you went. And I went to the ED. I was fortunate there was nothing wrong, but I'm grateful that I made a decision that, you know, I'm not going to interrupt. I kept thinking, well, this is the family reunion. I'm missing out on all the good stuff and all the fun and all that. And I just said, nope, you got to do what you got to do. And I did it. So I want to encourage you, if any of this happens, please, if you, you call your doctor, you don't get a response, I give everybody on this call permission, go to the ED. I'm a firm believer in use your emergency room. If you have called your physician and maybe they're not getting back with you because they're in clinic and a lot's going on, um, especially after three, if you call in, a lot of times they won't get back to you to 24 hours. Don't wait. Go. It's okay. You're not bothering anybody. What I hate when a patient tells me, oh, but I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to put anybody out. Please put me out. If I can help save your life, put me out. So please go to the ED. Bowel and bladder. 
Oh, I have a good story. So I was working at the HIV clinic. Um, and this is just an instance of me saying to myself and listening to some instinct inside of me saying, you might want to look at this. The patient called. And a lot of times they have a lot of bowel issues because they get HIV AIDS into their gut and it's called DMAC. And it's a lot of stuff that goes wrong with that. So the guy calls me and he says, listen, I need you to call me some Dr. Lucan. So we knew each other. We had a relationship. And he said, I have, um, uh, he told me that he had thrush and that I need to give him Zyflucan, which is the, which is the remedy. So this guy knew what he was talking about, but I said, some of me said, we shouldn't come in. So I had him come in. And, um, the first thing I noticed was I said, how much weight have you lost? He's like, Oh, 20 pounds. I said, dude, what happened? He says, well, I can't eat because of the thrush. I said, well, get up on this table and let me look. And he got up on the table and I put the light in his mouth and, um, okay, I'm country. We call it a canker sore. Uh, the official title is an aptus ulcer was about this big. And I hope you can see my hands because I don't have the, the video up, but it was about this big on the top of the roof of his mouth. So his whole entire hard palate was an aptus ulcer. And the reason why he couldn't eat was not thrush. The reason why he couldn't eat was because he needed steroids to help heal that thing so that he could get food in his mouth. And so I was very grateful that I was able to treat, but it was really concerning that, you know, sometimes um, I need your help, but sometimes let us help you too, because, you know, um, he already had given me the diagnosis. And if I hadn't said, well, can I just bring you in and look at it? He didn't tell me about the 20 pound weight loss. He didn't say, by the way, I've lost 20 pounds. Because when he walked in, because I knew him so well, I'm like, oh, my God, are you on a diet? Like, dude, what happened? It was so astounding that I knew something was wrong. So other things that you can have before, during, or after having chemotherapy, and you can be um, totally out of treatment and still have issues with diarrhea. Um, we have patients, especially in the kind of cancers I do, that they end up with a colostomy bag. And because it's so high up, just FYI, your intestines loves water. And it's one of the best water reservoir, uh, reservoirs for the body. And the body loves to pull it out of there. So it's like, oh my God, there's extra water. Get to the intestines, pull it out. So that's why when you need to go to the bathroom, you don't need to hold it and wait because your stool is drying out every minute that we're talking because the body loves water and it's going to find a source and it's going to use your intestines. But the higher up you have a colostomy bag, the more liquidy, right? Because it hasn't gotten to the bottom to dry out yet. And we have people that have gone through chemo, done with treatment, and they're just pouring out of these bags, just pouring out. It can dehydrate you. It can mess with your electrolytes. I've had people that they're having so much stool and they don't have a colostomy bag that they're almost crippled. And I've seen that. Um, you can have diarrhea because you have irritable bowel. You can have diarrhea because of radiation treatments you've had or chemotherapy treatments you've had or targeted therapy treatments you've had or immunotherapy treatments you've had, foods that disagree with you. Um, you can have liquid diarrhea, especially when I'm dealing with some of my patients that's had, that, that, that have had some type of um, surgery where the blockage is there and you're thinking I'm stooling. No, you're not really because you have a blockage. Liquid is pouring around it trying to get out because that muscle is going to continue to try to cramp and work because your body is still working. The intestine hasn't forgotten what it's supposed to do. So I have another diarist when I was working HIV. Um, one of my patients decided to go on a wonderful hike. And I was like, okay, so what did you do on that hike? Well, Renice, the water looks so pristine. No, tell me you didn't. Yes, he did. It looked so pristine that he drank a cup of it and he got Giardia. And he was totally debilitated from diarrhea. So even if you're not immunocompromised, don't drink river water. Um, and so for me, um, antibiotics, of course, help with that situation. But Oh my God, I couldn't believe that my current immunocompromised HIV AIDS patient, because where I worked at, you had to have AIDS, meaning you've had to have one of the opportunistic infections 
So I didn't just do HIV. You had to have had AIDS. You went to a river and it looked clean and you drank it. Another thing that can happen is antibiotics, C. difficile. This is cancer, non-cancer. So you come to this planet with beautiful flora in your gut that loves to help you make a stool. And when we give you antibiotics, it doesn't say, well, I'm just going to mess with that strep throat. It says, well, you know what? Anywhere that needs an antibiotic, I'm going to hit every part of your body. And what happens is we kill off the good bacteria in your gut. And what happens is profuse diarrhea. And people can have up to 20 stools a day. And it is debilitating. Um, but we have treatment for it. Um, it is infectious. And so another thing that makes this hard is when you have GR, you have the C. difficile or the cryptosporidium. I also had a patient that had diarrhea from cryptosporidium. When you have these kind of diarrheas, we can't stop it because we can actually hurt you and harm you by not allowing you to get that, those, those infected um, bugs out of your system. So a lot of times you're like, well, why don't you just give me Imodium? No, 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 no. What we need to do first is make sure that you're okay by giving you um, uh, treatment and then once we know that you're out of the clear, we give you something for the, uh, the diarrhea. High sugar supplements. And once again, when you have a large part of your colon removed. Suspect is when you have greater than five stools in one day. Alarming five to 10 liquid stools because I still need you to be able to walk. And when you become so depleted because I've given you, you having so many stools, um, it's concerning. So you need to say something if you're having more than five. And if you get more than five, it's like I call it almost an emergency because your electrolytes, you lose potassium, you lose in sodium. All that's going out with that stool. New belly pain, blood in your stool. Um, decreased or no urination means that you're probably very dehydrated. You're not able to eat. You're so debilitated. You can't you don't have the energy to eat and you don't want to eat. And every time you eat, you have diarrhea. So you stop eating. So these are concerning things. Another thing is constipation. As I told you, we eat a lot of processed food. Standard American diet is very constipating because we don't eat enough vegetables. We don't eat enough in our, in our diet to help keep things moving. Um, hard stools. Um, so as I said before, outwardly we're nourished, but inwardly we're malnourished. Um, so this is something that's very concerning. And some of the drugs that we give you, Zofran can be very, for nausea can be very constipating. So some of the drugs we give you does, do not help the situation. Um, but there are things that we can do to help with that also. Um, remember that even if you're constipated and you're having liquid stool around it, just make sure that you understand that it could be that you have some kind of blockage. Um, having a lot of belching, bloating, nausea and vomiting. These are things that you just need to pick up and say, listen, I don't know what's going on, but I'm constipated. I haven't gone in whatever amount of time. And we at that point take over and decide what's going on and try to help you figure out, is this something we need to do a full um, laxative protocol for, or is this something that's a little bit more concerning? In the surgical patient, it might be a little bit more concerning than somebody who maybe just is dealing with something that has no kind of um, uh, implication with the bowel. The bowel was not involved. If you are post-surgery, even years later, I was working an outpatient clinic for Grady in a primary care clinic, and a guy came in and he says, I think I have a small bowel obstruction. Well, first of all, when anybody tells me they think they've had something before and you've had it before and you think you got it again, I believe you. If you had an MI before, you had a heart attack and it feels the same, believe me, I trust you. You probably are having a heart attack again. So when you come in and tell me you've had a small bowel obstruction before, I believe you because you've had it before and you've been hospitalized before. So that is one of my little pearls. If you've had it before, I believe you. Let's go with it. So this guy had had appendicitis about 10 years before. And he said about every three years, he had a small bowel obstruction. Now they have a lot of stuff they put in you like snow, something called snow now that my doctors use. And it helps try to keep you from having all these adhesions inside your belly when you have some kind of surgery. Um, but um, every three or four years, he told me he just closed down and we did conservative measures. We put him in the hospital, he'd get a nasal gastric tube down his nose, help decompress the bowel, meaning we helped flatten out everything so that he could get all the gases out and he would open up on his own. So he never had to have surgery to repair it, but it was very inconvenient that every three or four years, your bowels are shutting down and you're actually obstructed because of adhesions or scarring that you have secondary to a surgery. Dietary issues, oh my God, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm ashamed to say that my diet was horrible. I was very skinny um, in my 20s and 30s, so I ate what I wanted to. And when you eat what you want to, that doesn't mean 
eating vegetables because like I could eat McDonald's every day and not gain two pounds. So I ate what I wanted, had very high cholesterol and had dietary issues with my gut, my intestines, because I wasn't basically giving it what it needed, fiber to actually work. Diverticular disease can ensue. And so we've had a situation where we're dealing with a patient. I've done, we've done a hysterectomy, but guess what? They asked, they actually perforated their diverticular. And a diverticular is like a little pooch that comes off your intestines because you're straining to have a BM. And so we've actually had those break after the person had the surgery and they had to go back and get that fixed. So just know that constipation is not a place you want to be. Um, and just talk to your primary care. Um, some people have to be laxative dependent, which is not good, but a lot of people are on Miralax. Um, but a lot of dietary changes can help with that. And I'm a huge proponent, if you're not hearing anything else, is your diet and what you're putting in your mouth can actually be resolved. Some of the situations that you have just by being mindful of what you're eating. Chemotherapy brain and altered brain. And I'm going to sort of pick up the pace because I'm running out of time because I talk too much. So um, cognitive changes, fogginess before, during and after treatment. Um, so having some type of memory lapses, lapses concentration issues. Chemo brain is real. Um, it is not, um, you know, um, something that people make up. Um, details not clear, um, names, addresses, and difficulty multitasking and grasping for, work, for words. And so some help that you can get is something called cognitive rehab. Once again, my favorite exercise, meditation, which is meaning just quieting yourself, um, I do meditation um, through prayer and quiet times with God. You might have a different method of doing meditation, but just quieting your, your, yourself, quieting your mind, quieting your brain. Um, we are very hyperactive. Got my phone with me, got my music in my ear, got my pods, got my this, got my that. Very, very much very stimulated and trying to reduce some of that stimulation, getting the right amount of rest, reducing demanding tasks getting routines, avoiding alcohol and other agents, and family support is a biggie. Um, the altered mental status, whether you have cancer, do not have cancer, um, is very concerning. Um, because the bottom line is, it could not be cancer, it could be a stroke, it could be something else going with you. As I told you, an older person with a urinary tract infection, you might find them almost lethargic and comatose. So altered mental status, um, I would say for your family, you just need to make sure that you tell them, like, if I change my behavior or how I'm talking or my mood, we need to call 911. Um, I wouldn't even call the doctor. I would just you're going you're going to the ER um, when you find that you can't wake a person up. I had a situation where I had a patient and literally like, I mean, I know you're tired, but um, you can't hold a five minute conversation with me. Not 30, a five minute The patient kept falling back asleep on me. He kept falling back asleep on me. And it was very, very, very concerning. And um, just sometimes that nursing spider sense, I knew something was wrong. There was something wrong. So if somebody can't stay awake, and I know, and you know, a lot of people kept saying, well, you know, she's tired because of all the care she gave to her family members, blah, 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 blah. But something wasn't right. Um, you change your speech and how you're talking changes in your mood. If you're a pretty even person and I start seeing a little bit more aggression or, you know, or you get too quiet, I'm going to, I'm going to question what's going on. Um, judgment or decision-making changes, agitation or lethargic. So I'm wondering like, you know, what's going on? If you're a cancer patient or been a cancer patient, the first thing I'm going to do is probably CT your brain or MRI your brain to make sure there's nothing going on. Um, I'll never forget. I was in Navy duty out in I was in Camp Pendleton. No, I was in Pensacola, sorry. I was in Pensacola and this lady came in and this is not ultimate mental status, but I just want to tell you about not forgetting that I need to make sure I'm looking forward to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, and she came in, I think she had something going on. It was nothing to do with her, her um, legs, but she told me that her legs were really bothering her. Like she said, I'm really having a lot of leg pain. Of course, I'm thinking, you know, DBT, blah, blah, blah. But it was the whole legs, like both, like from the top to the bottom. You know, and we kept talking and I looked in her chart and I said, well, you've had a history of breast cancer. Well, yeah, yeah, I had that 20 years ago. Okay, well, you need a bone scan. And 
I don't know what happened, but the nurse practitioner and I that worked in that clinic became friends and we're still lifelong friends. She called back later and said she had um, a recurrence of her cancer. So we're going to scan you. You just want to make sure there's nothing going on. But um, other things that can happen. Sorry, guys, that's my phone. On somebody from the hospital. Other things that can happen is pain medication. If you're on too much pain medicine, you're going to be altered. I'm going to look at your thyroid. Um, if you're off the streets and I didn't know who you were and I didn't know you had cancer, I'm going to check your thyroid. I'm checking your vitamin levels, like your B12, your iron. I'm going to look at you and make sure that there's nothing organically. What do you mean organic, Bernice? Something that I can fix quickly, like your thyroid's out of order. You're, you're B12 deficient. Um, your iron deficient. Something that I can help work on. I'm going to look at all that along with a brain scan or a CT. Are your oxygen levels too low? Oh my goodness. Have I not seen people whose oxygen levels too low? Either they're very lethargic or they're actually agi agitated in the bed and they're fighting in the bed. Low blood sugars. Um, I was in the prison. My first emergency in the prison, um, I had a little golf cart. They had a little siren on top and they, they call a man down, man down. Like, oh my God, it's my first emergency. There's no doctor in the hospital. It's just me. I'm the, the coverage. <laughs> I was like screaming, like, oh my God. So me, the nurse, it was like one of those moments on a show. I had my little bag, the nurse and the respiratory therapist. We all had bags and we're running down the steps. We get in our golf cart. I start the golf cart up and I'm just, I'm a going and the little sirens going off and we get to him and he's down. And I'm like, okay, well, we're not going to treat him here. His blood pressure is okay. Let's take him back up to the, to the clinic. So get him to the clinic. Blood pressure still good. And they said to me, he just left dialysis. They said to me, um, he's a diabetic. I said, let's check his sugar. Well, the normal sugar is 80 to 100, and he was 10. And I was very thankful that we were able to treat him, and he woke back up, and he was actually in his right mind, because that's very low. Um, so we're going to check your blood sugars. Um, is there some kind of infection going on that's causing you to be altered because it's made you septic, and now you're having an issue, or are you in some type of organ failure? So these are things that we're going to look at. We're going to start with the top of, you know, if you've had cancer, we're going to make sure there's nothing going on in your brain. And then we're going to just start looking through your body, just making sure there's nothing else going on. Um, oh, my abscess grady tooth person. 21 years old, had an abscess in her tooth. And because she didn't have dental insurance, she tried to just self-care. And it ended up going systemic. And this girl was ventilated and altered at 21 from an abscess tooth that went full body. So just understand that you can get an infection that will cause you to actually not be in your right mind. And this kid, until we got her treated, got her on antibiotics and took care of that and she had to have oral surgery, um, she was totally um, altered. So some pearls. I'm a denial person. I'll, I, I put my hands up and I confess. I like like to minimize because I want to think there's nothing wrong with me and getting sick is inconvenient. So a lot of times I will try to push through and ignore. Another thing is not listening to your loved ones. I cannot tell you how many men have lost their lives not listening to their wives. If you're a man on this, please listen to your loved ones loved one um, because your loved one is going to probably save your life. I cannot tell you how many men have told me my wife insisted that I do this. My wife made me come to the doctor. So I encourage that. But I'm not a guy and I'm pretty bad about denial and running. So um, try not to be the person that I have been that I'm going to push through. Uh, try not to be the person who I worked in Fusion Center part time. And what I've seen is I can't can't miss my chemo. So I know I'm sick, but I'm coming anyway. I got to come because you're so worried that you're going to miss your chemo, but you show up sick. And then I send you to the ER anyway, you don't get your chemo. And you don't want us giving you chemo if you got a fever and you're sick, because guess what? I'm about to drop your accounts and I'm not trying to help you not do well. So a lot of times I've actually had people get really upset with me that they had to go to the hospital and Mr. Chemo, but nobody haphazardly is trying to make you miss your chemo. We're just understanding that if I give you something while you have chemo, while you, I give you chemo while you're really sick, I might reduce your chances of survival. I can't say it any clearer. I might reduce your chances of survival. I might aid and abet you in not surviving. Another person told me, 
They ignored the symptoms because they knew they had an appointment in two months. So I said, I'll tell them then, please don't do that. Somebody actually told me that in the last month. Don't do that. Be your best advocate, but also be willing to listen and hear advice and weigh your decision. This is your body. I believe in self-determination. You know, I had HIV patients tell me, I'm not taking that stuff. I'm not taking that HIV med. Okay. Can you keep coming see me every three months? I'm okay with that. Correct your diet. Exercise. Start slow. Like I told you, I'm on day two of walking. Don't just do cancer follow-up with um, your primary care. So if you have been a cancer patient, you need to do your follow-ups that your cancer doctor said, come see him. And you need to go for your other health issues to your primary care. Your cancer doctor, once again, cannot help you with your primary care issues. Don't say that they're managing me because I will get scared for you. Get an annual exam. I go every year to get an annual exam. Get an annual exam. I cannot stress that enough. Have an honest conversation about end of life with your family. I'll never forget the day. I was here probably like two years and I had a patient come in and her mother was deathly ill and we began to have the end of life talk. And I cannot tell you the wailing that this daughter did. And she said, if mama had only told me what she wanted, if mom had only said what she wanted me to do. I had this discussion with my mother at 68. She was not ill. She might have been younger than that. She might have been like 64, 65. Yeah, she probably like, yeah, she was much younger than that. And she got really scared because, I mean, I think sometimes in, in African-American culture, we think you're putting juju on me by even bringing this up. I'm not trying to put no juju on you. I'm trying to know what you want me to do. And so sometimes we think, well, if I speak it, it goes into the atmosphere and then I'm going to get sick. No, 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 no. I've told people, look, if I'm incapacitated and I'm in a vegetative state, please let me go. But please have an honest discussion with your family so that your family doesn't have the guilt, the wailing, the crying, because they feel guilty by saying, so you're telling me there's no hope? And we say yes, but because you didn't give them permissions, they are terrified and they won't make a decision. Cancer or no cancer, have a discussion. Get your affairs in order. Uh, will power of attorney, a medical durable power of attorney in the state of Georgia is 500 to 1,000 bucks. Um, Aid Atlanta will help you if you do not have any kind of, um, sorry, not Aid Atlanta, but um, legal, legal aid for Atlanta, sorry, legal aid for Atlanta will help you if you don't have any type of finances, but you need to have a will, a power of attorney and a medical power of attorney. You need to have somebody speak for you. If something happens to you, you need to make sure that somebody can get into your accounts. Nobody can touch your accounts. Your mama can have $10 million in the bank, but if she doesn't have a power of attorney and she's in the hospital incapacitated and she can't help you sign or get you into an account and you don't have access to her account, you will not be touching that account. They're not going to let you in. And you need a death certificate at that point to be able to get in. And it's still a, a, a torturous event. So I would advise anybody in here, these are just pearls, do those things. I want to thank everybody for allowing me to have this discussion. Um, I am not the expert <laughs> on everything. Um, I believe in the SIEVE approach, S-I-E-V-E. -E. Anything that you're like, are, is she serious? Let it fall through. But anything that resonates with you or just know that I do care. I've been doing this 30 years. I love what I do. I love patients. I love being a nurse practitioner. I love being a nurse. Um, and I love taking care of pe people. So all I'm going to say is if anything resonates with you, please let it stick to you and run with it. And I'm going to turn it back to Katie for any questions or thoughts or anything of that nature. Thank you, Renice. I think that was so many good points, not to only... I like the point of empowering yourself to call, but talking to a caregiver, your family member to say, hey, if you're noticing this, call for me if I'm, you know, starting to have an altered mental status. So empowering those around you too. Um, I think earlier in the presentation, you talked about high fever. Um, should you try any fever reducing medications before contacting um, your primary care physician? And if you are someone who has been diagnosed with cancer, are there any kind of medications to avoid? Like, should you not take ibuprofen or anything like that? I think if you hit 100.5, you have to make a call, whether you have cancer or you don't have cancer. 
then I advise you to take something for the fever, like take a Tylenol. Tylenol is an anti-fever or take an ibuprofen, but Tylenol is known for anti-fever properties. So I would take that. So, but I would definitely 100.5, there's something going on in you. That is not the normal. You shouldn't be running around like that. You know, 99, eight, I'm like, okay, you know, we can just sort of watch and wait. But at 100.5, that's my cutoff. Whether you have cancer or you don't, if you come into my primary care and you have 100.5, something's going on. Something inside of you is going on. Okay, thank you. And then another question that came in is, how long after surgery should you be on alert for DVT? And are, is there anything to kind of help reduce the probability of a clot? If you've had cancer or have been a cancer patient, you should always be on alert. I would stay on my guard um, and not minimize something that's happening 10 years from now. Um, uh, I'm not saying that you need to always walk around like, you know, scared, all that. But I think you need to know your body. If I can say anything, know your body, know your body. Um, a lot of times I'll ask somebody, for instance, if I have an asthma patient, they tell me, oh, you know, um, you know, and they have a lot of asthma. Oh, forget that. How about COPD? Um, emphysema, sorry, from being a smoker. And what I'll ask is, is your shortness of breath that you're telling me you've had, is it the same, better or worse? That's my three things I ask. If it feels like your baseline shortness of breath, I'm not going to be as concerned as you say it feels worse than my norm, because that's knowing your body. You've got to know your body. If you've never bled from your rectum or your vagina, and if you do, you should be calling somebody. But those are things that, you know, you need to call. Like there's something wrong. Don't minimize. I've had people that, you know, at the age of 50 to 55, you should no longer have periods. If you start a period at 60, there's something wrong. Well, I knew for a year, but it was just spotty. Well, you shouldn't be on a period. You shouldn't be spotty. So there's just some things that you need to say, but I think sometimes too, people are embarrassed. They don't want to talk about it, especially a little bit of our older generation. They don't really want to talk about some of those things, but um, yeah, you need to, um, uh, I'm sorry, Katie, give me the question again. Cause I'm just like all over the place now talking. Sorry. That's okay. I think, is there anything you can do to avoid it? Um, yes. Um, things you can do avoiding it is stay hydrated. Um, and the, the bottom line is, is that your risk is higher after surgery for probably six to eight weeks. It does get less, but having cancer puts you at risk. Cause remember, if you have a recurrence, the first indication you might have is that you have a clot. Um, and so just be careful and mindful that if you've had a history of cancer, um, that you need to be aware that there is always that chance. If something comes back, if you're in remission and you don't have any signs of it, yeah, you probably have no chance, but if something starts behaving differently, like you get a swelling in your leg, don't ignore it. Don't just say, oh, I got bit by a mosquito and just keep it moving. You need to do something about it. And this, I think, ties in with the blood clot. A participant shares that um, she was told she's at a higher probability of having a blood clot because of the removal of a lymph, no lymph node from both her underarms and was told uh, to lower her arms whenever blood is drawn or IVs. Is that something that's helpful with blood clots? I cannot answer that. That's out of my scope that I, I can't help with that one. Okay. I, I, that one, I don't know. I don't want to even try to answer and say that I, I, I don't know. I've never told anybody that, but I don't want to say that it's not true either. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry to that person. I'm sorry. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. Follow up. Maybe ask more questions with whomever shared that with her. The physician. The physician. Um, her, ask your physician. If I don't have the answers, ask your physician. Another participant asked, do you have any advice for a person going on letrozole? Um, I understand that there will be hot flashes. Yeah, but it ain't something you want to hear. Um, we use a lot of effects or uh, which is a SSRI, which is an antidepressant, which actually works against hot flashes. But the problem with effects is they don't tell you this is that it also makes you never have an orgasm again if you're a man or a woman. So when I was working at Georgia Cancer Specialist, that's what I heard. Like these women were coming like, girl, I'm, my marriage is about to be ruined. And so it stops the hot flashes, but it has side effects. Um, there are some over-the-counter products that they do recommend that are non-estrogen based. 
Um, and you can ask your physician. I haven't done breast cancer in a long time, um, but they actually, we actually recommend it. It's like something called FEM something. But ask your, um, your oncologist. They actually have some non um estrogen herbal things that you can try to see if that works for you because yes it does cause hot flashes and i'm an older lady that has had hot flashes and it ain't no joke so yes i would talk to my um, medical oncologist and say is there something herbal that i can take over the counter that you recommend and we did used to recommend some things when i was at georgia cancer specialist okay um and i think too when you talked about um the having diarrhea and part of the presentation i think you said to maybe avoid using emodium we had a participant ask if that's something across the board you should know your- oh, okay i said if you have infectious diarrhea okay so if you have not been diagnosed and they've done a stool sample and you do not have infectious diarrhea i think you need to use as much emodium as you can for the for the instructions on the box I've also used um, something called um, having a brain infarct. Um, oh my gosh. Questran. I've used Questran. Had a lady, I mean, literally was debilitated. Um, I did not recognize her six months later after she got on Questran, which is basically met if you, we, at Grady, we called it, you know, we use Metamucil because a lot of patients that they're in my AIDS clinic didn't have insurance. We called it, we used Metamucil. It was a, it's a high fiber thing that, you think about Renise, that's to help us make a stool, but no, but remember, it's it's absorbing water, so it slows down the stool. So I use Questran, I will use Questran and Imodium or Lamodal. Um, and one lady we're using Questran, and we actually went to the tincture of opium, which is very hard to find now because it's so old school. But her colostomy was putting out so much that this lady was in the hospital every time we turned around. So we decided to use tincture of op- opium and Questran. So no infectious diarrhea is when you have diarrhea and we have taken a sample and we tell you you have giardia you have cryptosporidium you have c difficile those are the kind of diarrheas you do not want to stop because you don't want to actually end up um killing the person because the 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 bacteria does not get out regular common diarrhea that you have you don't have that issue no Okay, that makes sense. I think people will be relieved to hear that too, the difference. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that today's program is being recorded. So if you know somebody who was unable to attend today's live program, they can check out a recording on our video library on our website. Um, So thank you everybody for joining us. And one last thought, if you don't mind, Katie, I don't mean to talk. If there are questions you have, I want you to be your best advocate and ask your doctor. Please don't let embarrassment get in your way. Please don't let, what I try to tell people is I work for you. I'm employed by you. And so if I'm employed by you, then you have a right as my employer to ask, tell, or whatever you need to um, as the employee. So um, I'm not doing you a favor by taking care of you. You know, I am totally blessed um, by, you know, the emotional part, but also God has blessed me financially for this job that I do. So if I can empower you to see it that way, that we work for you. So please get past, I'm bothering you. Um, I didn't want to, you know, be that patient that constantly asks things. I didn't want to, I want to encourage you that, you know, this is your life. You have a right to ask any questions. I have actually been fired from a practice because I was asking too much, too many questions. It's okay. Um, Because if that upsets you, then you're probably not the right person for me because I should have a right to ask questions. If I don't understand, and especially during cancer care, my dad passed from cancer. It's very emotional. Um, It's very um, heart rending. You'd have thought I was sick. My dad was trying to comfort me and he was the one that was ill with cancer. What I'm telling you is, is that sometimes you're so emotionally overwrought that you might ask the same questions over and over again. It's okay. I'd advise you to take somebody with you to write down stuff so that when you're not filtering well, because you're so, um, and especially in cancer care, to me, things go slow, then they speed up so fast. Your head is spinning like, oh my God, I got to make a decision about this. I got to make a decision about this. I gotta make, And you're so overwhelmed that it's very hard to process. Um, I also recommend when you get out of treatment, I had a patient come through and, you know, I was like, woo, woo, three months, you know, she, you know, she was done and woo, 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 and she broke down crying. I'm like, well, why are you crying? Like, you know, you, you're cured and you're, you're great. And she said, 
but I had you guys supporting me. I had the friendships and I had people in the chemo room to talk to and I had all that and I'm single and I don't have any of that and I'm by myself and nobody gets it and you know nobody at my job. So I would encourage you also afterwards, you have the cancer support community, you have other uh, support groups, get involved. Um, don't feel like you're alone because it is hard once you leave the structure of all the stuff that we're doing or in the middle of it. So I just wanted to encourage you in that factor that first of all, we work for you, ask any questions you want to, um, understand that you might feel um, disoriented once you get through a treatment because you're not having that structure and the friendships and the, and, the, and the linking and somebody watching over you. We're here for you. And if I can say anything for you, you are not an inconvenience, you are important and you have a right to contact us and ask us anything. I'm done, sorry. No, thank you. I love that sentiment of empowerment and patience with your own self too. I think sometimes we need to encourage ourselves to be patient with ourselves. Thank you everybody again for joining us. Um, thank you again, Renice, so much for being so generous with your time and expertise. And we hope to see you guys all again soon. Thank you. Take care. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.